outdoor adventure. life of mountains, the ambitions of human beings mean no more than the flakes of snow that swirl from their rocky ridges. The mountain is everlasting, and the lives of man are transitory. This is the top of the world, the summit of Mount Everest. No mountain has ever captured the fantasy and ambition of man as this one has. The mountaineers who have stood on this peak are the most elite group of climbers in the world. Over the years, nearly 2,000 mountaineers have tested themselves against the winds of Everest. For every 10 who have tried, only one has succeeded. And for every 10 who have succeeded, three have died in the attempt. This film is about 12 Americans who came to Everest in 1984 to pit their courage and skill against the world's ultimate climbing challenge. Since Hillary's first successful climb in 1953, only 170 climbers have stood at this highest point of a mountaineer's dream. The rarest of all mountaineers are those who have climbed Everest from the Chinese side, the legendary North Face. Only 16 have done that, and 11 have died trying. The first American team to attempt the North Face was the 1982 China Everest Expedition an expedition that ended in defeat and tragedy. The only woman member of the team, Marty Hoy, was killed. In a freak accident at 26,600 feet, her waist harness gave way and she fell 6,000 feet to her death. One more summit attempt was made, and that too ended in near disaster. Larry Nielsen was turned back with frostbitten hands and feet and had to be carried down the mountain by backpack. Phil Urschler expressed the feelings of the defeated team. You spent three months of your life to travel halfway around the world, play havoc with your health, lose maybe one of the best friends you've ever had, and you can't help eventually but sit down at some time and, and contemplate, was it worth it? Would I do it again? Now, two years later, the answer to that question is plain. Yes, they would do it again. Once again, the team departs on the long approach to Everest through China. Of the 11 climbers on this 1984 team, six are returning with clear and poignant memories of their defeat in 1982. Lou Whitaker, 
the expedition leader, Jim Wickwire, Phil Urschler, Steve Martz, Dave Mayer, George Dunn, and team physician Dr. Ed Hickson. New members are John Roskelly, Peter Whitaker, John Smolich, Greg Wilson, and camp manager Carolyn Gunn. Half the people in this large group are support team. They will go as high as base camp and return. On the flight from China to Tibet, the team catches their first glimpse of the Himalayas. Their thoughts begin to focus on the climb. For expedition leader Lou Whitaker, the mountains are his whole life. As a mountaineering professional, Whitaker knows the world's great peaks intimately, and he knows what is needed to survive. Whitaker relies on his long experience, knowledge that has become intuitive in choosing his climbing team. Many of the members of this team work with Whitaker throughout the year at his guide service in Washington State, Rainier Mountaineering. Different people prepare themselves mentally in different ways because you have to be mentally prepared and not just to reach the top but just to survive on an expedition and to produce on an expedition as a good carrier and a good climber and that takes a positive attitude toward the mountain that comes with knowing the team knowing the mountain knowing yourself one of lou's closest climbing companions is jim wickwire a lawyer in seattle I think there's a, of course, there's a, quite a contrast between sitting behind a desk in an office and going off to climb a Mount Everest. Uh, I can't go off to the mountains uh, every weekend and certainly not during the week very often. So uh, I try to do 100 flights or maybe 150. And that is the best exercise that I've found for uh, building up your leg strength as well as, as your wind and a cardiovascular uh, your respiratory system but uh, I've always felt that uh, mental attitude or uh, motivation is uh, by far more important ingredient to successful climbing than than being in good condition the route to the Chinese side of Everest the North Wall lies through Tibet one of the most remote and exotic countries in the world The capital city of Lhasa is already higher than most mountains. The sudden transition from sea level to 12,000 feet requires acclimatization. Even for mountaineers as experienced as this team, several days are necessary for their bodies to adjust to the altitude. After two days of acclimatizing in Lhasa, the team leaves on a five-day journey that will eventually bring them to base camp. The pastoral valleys around the mountain soon give way to a barren, dry, desolate land. Cramped into a rickety bus, the team begins an ordeal of dusty confinement along the mountain roads that become narrower and more dangerous every mile. John Roskelly, a new member of the team, is impatient for the inactivity and confinement. When the bus stops to refill the radiator, Roskelly walks on ahead, sometimes for miles. Roskelly is a professional mountaineer who has spent much of his life climbing, but he is also a family man. Hey, Joyce, come on over here. He tries to minimize the stress on his family at home. Joyce has been good for years and years about this. It's a matter of she knows when to worry, as, as she puts it, rather than worry the entire period of time. Uh, she trusts me enough to know that I'm not going to make a bad judgment error. I've taken enough calculated risks to know that that short-term period of the summit is one of the few times that you really do have to take it. And uh, that's, I think, why I've been successful and that's why I'm still alive, because I know when to take a, a certain degree of risk. Ross Kelly is one of the most respected high-altitude mountaineers in the world. He has never climbed with Lou Whitaker's team before. He has a reputation as a fiercely independent man, a climber who believes in his own way of doing things. The other mountaineers have all agreed that they'd use oxygen if it becomes necessary. Ross Kelly's climbing ethic forbids it. And in respect for Ross Kelly's high-altitude capabilities, Whitaker has allowed him to be an exception to the rule. Roskelly will not climb with the assistance of oxygen. Climbing without oxygen for me is important because I've done 
all my Himalayan peaks without, including K2. And I feel within myself that I can make the summit of Everest without. And it puts more emphasis and more importance on how you get to the summit rather than what summit you stand on top of. As the Chinese bus strains across the 16,000 foot passes outside of Lhasa, the team begins to draw together. Here, sharing the discomforts of the route, they are transformed from tourists in a strange land into a climbing team. Sometimes roads are so narrow that the bus is empty for the crossing. The evidences of civilization dwindle away to nothing. Outside the bus, terrain is so inhospitable, it seems unlikely anyone could live there. Still, they pass small groups of Tibetans miles from any civilization, repairing these high mountain roads by hand. The last outpost of civilization is the monastery of Tashilumpa. Now, they are well beyond the range of Western tourists. Here, the Americans themselves are the exotic attraction, as strange to the Tibetans as the Tibetans are to them. The monks here have never seen a blonde, hairy-chested Westerner, and they're curious. But that is only a surface appearance. Within the monastery of Tashilampo is a mystery more profound and more moving than any mere physical difference. This is the inner sanctuary of the sacred, the essence of the Tibetan reverence for the divine. A gigantic gilded Buddha presides in the dimly lit smoky hall. There is a spiritual vibrancy here. It is a place as unique as the summit of Everest itself and is radiant with power. In this timeless, remote sanctuary of religion, the Westerners realize how far they are from their accustomed world. Only the working team remains, settling in to finding their strategy. At this time, I'm told that it's early enough for the axe to drop their loads and come back, so there'll be nobody sleeping up there, and that'd be good if the team didn't sleep up there either. You guys would see the gear into it, say hello and bail out. Much of the equipment must be transferred to a chain of higher camps to prepare for the summit assault. The Tibetan yak is the only beast of burden that can carry at these altitudes. The climb is now on an assault schedule. Even this early, the climbers are conscious of a mid-October deadline. A day lost now can become a serious threat later, and they lose a day. Dave Mayer and John Smolich accompany the yak train up the mountain, but aren't able to communicate with the Tibetan herders. Because of the communication problem, 
The first load of equipment is left a half mile too low and has to be moved. Whitaker communicates through an awkward chain, Lou to the Chinese interpreter, interpreter to the cook who speaks Tibetan, the cook to the yak herders. I'm going to talk to you. Uh, two of our members were there, uh, John Smolich and Dave Mayer, and told them that this was not Camp 3, that Cam uh, Smolich had an altimeter. You could see on his altimeter that it was not high enough. Too low. <音>他讲啊这个是不是不缺钱哦这个当时有两个队员在那哦那张和这个另外一个在那哦这个当时拿着高度表给他们看说的这个高度呢这么还没到呢你看说也还还往前走说是有两个队员在那第二段上去的时
losing two precious weeks, Lou Whitaker leads a team of five climbers to try and set up Camp 6 and make a summit attempt. The winds are still in jet stream intensity, often rising to 70 and 80 miles an hour. Fierce gusts tear the side shields from Lou Whitaker's goggles, and his eyes begin to freeze. Soon, the leader of the expedition is nearly blind. Yeah, how you doing? I broke my damn eyes. My cornea is as good a one since came here. Did you come down blind, or what? Yep. I can just see a shadow, real faint. That's all I can see. In order not to delay the expedition further, Lou insists that his companions continue without him. Alone and almost blind, Lou clips himself to the fixed rope and slowly descends to Camp 3. It will take almost a week for his sight to return. succeeds in re-establishing Camp 5, but the victory is a short-lived one. There's an incredible freedom that comes from all... It is now early October. The team has lost weeks because of the avalanche hazards and the storms. In addition, they are beginning to realize that there is a serious and dangerous flaw in their strategy. Camp 5 is continually raked by Everest's ferocious winds. The wind has literally blown away heavy bags of food stored outside the tent. Pinned down by the howling gales at Camp 5, the climbers watch an Australian team pick their way up the sheltered canyon called the Great Coulard. After retreating to advanced base camp, in a planning meeting, the team decides to make another attempt to reach the summit. Get John and uh, go up to the base and see what it looks like. We got a day like this for the summer. On October 8th, Ursula, Dunn, and Smolich set out to establish Camp 6 in the Great Coulard, where they hope to find protection from the relentless wind. They traverse the north face looking for a sheltered site from which they can make a summit assault. They believe the Australian team has left a tent at 26,600 feet, but this belief almost leads to disaster. Hey, Over. Ominously, this is the same altitude where an error of judgment cost the life of Marty Hoy in 1982. This high on the mountain, oxygen starvation makes rational judgment nearly impossible. The summit team confers with base camp by radio. climbers now face a choice of two critically dangerous alternatives. Descending in darkness risks a fatal fall. To spend the night in open bivouac without a tent is also equally dangerous. From their vantage point several thousand feet lower, Whitaker and Roskelly counsel an open bivouac. But the final decision lies with a high altitude team. What's going on? Ursula, you're a bridge up mountaineer enough to know you can't come down the dark. You've got all the black gear, dig out a platform, and the 
During a night of extreme cold and misery, George Dunn, suffering from dehydration, begins to vomit and is seized by stomach cramps. At this altitude, the mountaineers need six liters of water per day. Because of their completely exposed position, the bivouacking team is unable to melt snow for water and cannot restore their fluid balance. Smolich is also sick, and neither climber has been able to keep food down. The next morning, after caching two bottles of oxygen, the climbers laboriously make their way down to Camp 4. Typically, the climbers play down their nightmarish experience. Well, I'm glad to see you. But, but uh, I'll tell you, I wish my worst client was nothing like this. Everybody's been, the client, I'm sure, can do better than this on a given day. Everybody's been worried all day long. Well, oh, nothing to worry about. Uh, everybody through the night. And no frostbite. Fantastic. Tell me about the descent. Actually, the descent wasn't too bad until that last little hill. <laughs> That's what the descent off Everest is going to be. Except first you got to climb Everest. And hopefully you won't have to do one. partner's doing? Not bad. Still got all my fingers. If I had to climb with anyone, those are the guys I'd like to be with. The 25, 26,600 feet. All I'd Fantastic. They're good. They have that ability to survive. John. Yeah. How you doing, babe? Good to see you. Tell me a little bit about it. It was terrible, terrible. <laughs> On the descent from the bivouac, Smolich had been spitting blood. He will not be able to make another summit attempt. George Dunn is also out of commission. He is immediately taken to Camp 3, where he is given two liters of IV fluid. But his condition worsens, and his only hope is to return to base camp for medical treatment by the team physician. Things are now looking bleak. The summit team has been decimated. Urschler is still healthy, but without climbing partners. Some of the remaining climbers must be sacrificed as route pioneers to find a more protected site for Camp 5. They determine that from the shelter of the Great Kular, a final summit attempt will be possible. Now, Lou Whitaker faces a difficult and emotional decision. I've talked to Jim and uh, John Roskelly, Jim Whitaker and John Roskelly, and I'd like to see them on the, on the summit, the final summit attempt. They're both still chomping at the bit and uh, both still healthy. Their experience and, and ability put them, I think, kind of automatically into that first <coughs> slot. We've discussed the need for support, and then in turn we need support people. The support people would help get that summit team primed and into the right slot, something like maybe the new Camp 5 to go to the top. <coughs> We've talked about an ideal number for the summit team, I talked to Jim and John about that, and they said that they think maybe three would be an ideal Two number. logical choices are available for the third member. Lou's son Peter is strong and healthy, climbing well, and there is the considerable experience of Phil Urschler. 
<clears throat> that would leave a summit team of uh, three and a support team then of uh, maybe three or two, <clears throat> depending on who's available and ready. I know that uh, my son Peter is uh, still firing and going hard for the summit and still healthy <clears throat> and has tried a few times, quite a few times. <clears throat> but uh, I know also that uh, Phil is, has been on two attempts on Everest and this is his third. He's got a lot of experience and a lot of experience high. I'd like to ask Phil how healthy he is. I still feel good. Support our summit team with your purpose. Yes, I would like to go the opportunity rises. Dave, I've talked to you before about willing to support. Dave's always willing to support and always goes high. So I, I know I've got Dave in, in the realm there. I wonder, Pete, are you willing to support? And I'd like to be part of the, of the summit team, but I think at this point there's only the capacity for two or three people. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm strong and I'll do what I can to support. Peter is assigned to the trail-breaking team with Mayer, Wilson, and Smolich. Over the past month, every man has earned his right to attempt the summit. But some must break trail to establish the new Camp 5. They will exhaust themselves to prepare the trail for others. These three give up their chance at the summit in order to break a trail for the final summit attempt by Whitwire, Roskelly, and Urschler. breaking teams succeed in forcing their way across the Great Coulard to put in the new Camp 5. It is a victory for the team at a cost of great personal sacrifice for the Root Pioneers. On the 18th, Climbing in the comparative shelter of the Great Coulard, Wickwire, Roskelly, and Urschler set out to establish the final assault camp, Camp 6. Camp 6 will be a single small tent precariously tucked against a rock. They find the oxygen cache left during Ursler's near disastrous bivouac, but only one bottle remains. The other has been swept away by an avalanche. Now, three climbers remain, huddled in the tiny tent at 26,600 feet, Roskelly, Ursler, and Wickwire have become the last possible hope of reaching the summit. The morning of the 19th, the climbers decide that Wickwire will use the oxygen bottle as he had planned to do on any summit attempt. Urschler and Roskelly will climb it now. I was just trying to say, uh, Carolyn is sitting here and said, please tell him to give him, give him all my best, and I'm going to let her do that. Our thoughts are with you. Stay safe. Same from here, Wick, old friend, and just hang in there and keep putting one foot in front of the other, and that's all it's going to take. I'm going to give you all my strength and all my prayers. Within a few hundred feet, Roscalli is experiencing difficulty. The problem had begun the night before. His feet were swollen and painful from previous frostbite. I've taken two codeine and... They just kind of knocked me out. I, I was leaning on my ice axe and passing out. For Whitwire, already feeling things weren't exactly right, Roskelly's difficulty is the final evidence. Communication between the climbers is not good. Even the most experienced mountaineers have difficulty with high altitude confusion, perhaps the most dangerous condition on the mountain. None of the climbers is certain what the others are thinking. Wickwire and Urschler are alarmed by Roskelly's intermittent unconsciousness. And Roskelly is worried that the expedition will be called off on his account. Clearly, the attempt is becoming more dangerous with every passing minute. Wickwire radios Lou Whitaker at Camp 3. Well, that's the problem, Jim. 
Uh, no big medical emergency, but I think uh, uh, it's going to be better to get the uh, job out there. Okay, over. Uh, you're set, bro. Let me put John on. He can tell you what the problem is. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I'm just kind of passing out up here. Okay, well, I, I think it's over. I uh, want you to ring him out. You saw him coming down, John, okay? I'll just get out first and let him give me a balloon. The second and last son of a team has been defeated. And we'll be uh, looking for you coming down. Okay, that's the end of the climb. Looks like we've had it, baby. Alright, man, give me the big one. Yeah. No drift yet, we get up there. October. Camp 6 calling Camp 3. You copy. Camp 6 calling Camp 3. Ross Kelly is feeling better and convinced that his condition is due to the codeine. Camp 6 calling. He begins to argue to make another attempt the next day. Urschler is deeply discouraged and ready to descend. When we turned around that day, that had to be for me the lowest point of the expedition. I had the feeling that, well, I'm never going to make it to the summit of Everest on this expedition. But John was uh, very, very positive. He said to me, it's not going to be a problem for you to spend another night here at high camp, and we'll just climb the mountain in the morning. Lou Whitaker is making arrangements on the assumption that the climb is over. But when he next contacts the assault team, he receives a surprising message. Jim, I read you good. How is everybody feeling? On balance, we think the decision to come back to six today was the right one, although we took it in great haste. So our intention uh, would be to stay up here, give her another shot in the morning. Uh, not clear whether that would be all three of us or just two of the three over. If uh, there's any question at all that uh, John has got any other, uh, maybe other symptoms, I would abort the whole time, would it? It's a Roger, Roger, over. Uh, head through the best, and uh, if it's a two-man or three-man attempt or whatever you decide, uh, we go along with it here. Wick and John and I got into long discussions that evening about the use of the one bottle of oxygen that we had left at 27,000 feet at the base of the rock band. Uh, I felt that it would be a mistake for two to try to reach the summit without oxygen and one with. And since I felt that Ursler was stronger than I was at this point, I attempted to persuade him to be the one to use that oxygen bottle and to climb with John Roskelly the next morning. With this decision, Wickwire sacrifices his chance to stand on top of the world. He will remain at Camp 6 while Urschler and Roskelly make another summit attempt in the morning. What? Now there are two. In the early morning of the 20th, Roskelly and Urschler set out on the last summit attempt. Urschler leads to the 27,000 foot level where he picks up the cached oxygen bottle and Roskelly takes over the lead. Both of us were real cold, hands were cold. My hands were finally gone at that point, and so were my feet. See, I went up uh, another two pitches, traversed into a, a long snow slope off to the right, trying to get to a sunlit rib. And I figured once I got to the sunlight, I'd feel a heck of a lot better. This is Camp 4, calling Camp 3, over. Steve Martz, expedition cameraman at Camp 4 with a telephoto lens, is the only member of the team who can see the climbers. He reports their progress by radio. It looks like uh, Phil's almost up to him. Over. That's all right. That's a lot. So they're still moving and moving up. Definitely. They've got about 1,500 vertical feet to the summit. At that point, I was freezing inside as, bad, as well as my hands and feet were gone. And I was starting to shiver continually. Now, the difference between climbing with oxygen and without becomes apparent. With oxygenated blood, Urschler can maintain warmth in his body core. Roskelly's oxygen-starved body begins to freeze. Soon, the two climbers are effectively in different worlds. John said, you know, Phil, I'm having some real serious difficulties. I really feel the temperature draining out of my core. 
Uh, Phil uh, was belayed up to mid band to where John was, and it looked like they had a little they had a little conference. And now John's leading off. Over. Very good. Ursler is leading the last pitch. He's just uh, oh, I'd say 15 feet below the snow at the crest of the snowy ridge. Ursler runs straightly up to the great band, right? Roger. What elevation is that, Jim? That's a push of 28, you know. It could be 27, 6, or 7, over. They're making good progress then, over. You bet. We'll climb at a rate of about 3 to 400 feet an hour. Well, that's good news down here, Jim. We'll cross our fingers to I knew that he was moving faster than I was. They're having a long talk on I that. I told him there that I was getting really cold. And he said, let's go on up a couple more pitches. They're right at the foot of the gray band, and they've started to move. They're skirting it on the left, heading for the gullies. That means they're in the last thousand feet, and it'll take them probably three hours or two and a half hours to get to the summit. They're by no means going to stop at this point. I can tell you that. Over. Roger, I think they're committed. And would that be great, Rick Wire, baby? Well, I can guarantee you a summit at this point. There's a lazy cloud floating around up on the summit. Very good sign. We see some air, that's how it is. The way I was feeling at that point, I didn't think I could go for another three or four hours in the cold. And still turn around and make it down alive. John, uh, I think, is moving on the slow side. That's my impression. Uh, Phil's having to wait on him. Over. Thanks, Steve. This is camp four to all camps. John Ross Kelly is descending. Over. Phil is continuing to go up. Roger. I invest in graphite rods. Now, there is one. When Ross Gelly turned only 1,000 feet from the summit, the human pyramid that began so many months ago in the United States narrowed to a point like Everest itself. A single man trudging slowly up the highest peak on Earth, buoyed by the combined efforts of his team and carrying all their hopes. I just don't think that I was prepared for that scenario. I never really contemplated what I would do in a situation you know, if it was just myself. John and I were together on the mountain as a team. And if we made the summit, we are going to make it together. But if we didn't, well, that would be all right, too, as long as we came down both alive, taking care of each other. But, you know, I think the deciding factor for me was when John finally said, you know, look, Phil, you've got to think about how you're going to feel and how I'm going to feel when we look back on this. And both of us will know that you could have made the summit and that you didn't because you came down with me. There, uh, there wasn't really any discussion after that. It was simply a matter of untying from the climbing rope. And then we both shook hands and said goodbye and good luck. And um, John started down and I started up. John's about halfway to the top of the snow field that's right on top of the head wall. Over. There is a moment of intense relief when Ross Kelly makes his way back into Camp 6, welcomed by Wickwire. Roger, I'm ready. It's an opportunity to do that. This is uh, just by the center and right off the bat, Jim. Has John got any damage? He very disappointed he didn't get it, but he didn't think he'd make it back around, remember? John knows how we think about that. Without uh, John, we wouldn't be where he is. Phil's doing real well. He's making a beeline for what looks like the West Ridge. Uh, right below the summit. All right. It just looked like the easiest way to go. And it was still blowing pretty hard up on the mountain. And I thought that if I ran into some troubles up above, 
At least this way, well, maybe I get blown into the mountain instead of getting blown away from the mountain. I crested the summit ridge and gained the summit of Everest at about a quarter to four in the afternoon. Now, the goddess of mountains, Chomolungma, is still again, except for her halo of winds. A moment has passed. The flickering lives of men have come and gone. Their lives are changed through suffering and victory. The life of the mountain is unchanging. But the Tibetans know that in the end, there is no difference between the mountain and the men. The mountain is Buddha. The men are Buddha. The inner reality of all things is the Buddha. And the rest is only a dream.